minute 50 already. So, okay, right. So I'm going. I'm the token theorist here today. I think so. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, learning guarantees when we have fewer observations than the size of the model we're trying to construct. So this is um, interesting from several perspectives. So, uh, oh, hang on. Where's the joke? Oh, there we go. Okay. So motivation is small sample size problem. This is sort of ubiquitous in applications, in fact. Um, so typical instances are we have very high dimensional data. So, you know, maybe 1,000 dimensional data. Hardly any observations, tens or twenties, something like that. So inference is a hard problem. We get uh, correlations all over the place that shouldn't be there and very hard to avoid overfitting. A related problem and somewhat more topical, very high dimensional data, lots and lots of observations, but an even bigger model, like a deep net, for example. So maybe 1,000 dimensional data to start with, you know, a few thousand examples or tens of thousands of examples, and a million dimensional model, a million parameter model, so to speak. Okay, so there's this uh, the so-called riddle of over-parameterization, which we're just about starting to uh, get a handle on now. Uh, why does this work? Okay, why, why do things work in this situation? Okay, so uh, the, the problem really here is a sort of mismatch between the dimension and the sample size, yeah? So the obvious solution is to uh, make the dimensionality smaller and see what it costs us. That's uh, compression, yeah? Um, and classification is... Uh, it really is, is it, it should be a compressible problem because for two-class classification, all you need to do is retain enough information to infer one bit about a, a query point, yes, a label, positive or negative. So it should be possible to compress and uh, still have guarantees. And what we're going to look at is a random form of compression called random projection. So this has uh, mainly been motivated historically by something called the johnson lindenstrauss lemma, shows that if you take a, a matrix R that uh, maps down from Rd, where D is some high dimensionality, to Rk, and K doesn't depend on the uh, embedding dimension for the data, it just depends on the size of the points that you want to embed. In fact, it works for infinite dimensional spaces as well. And we can have this approximate guarantee on, uh, so the, the value in the middle is the norm between the projection of two points in that point set in the k-dimensional space and the sandwiching values on the outside of the, di the distance between those points in the original high-dimensional space, whatever that dimension is. Okay, so we can have a guarantee that that's preserved within a scaling factor of 1 plus or minus epsilon. Um, I won't prove that today. Not that <laughs> I don't have time. It's uh, dot products also approximately preserved by, you know, parallelogram law, law is the easiest way to do that. Um, K is sharp. We can't do better for an arbitrary set. Okay, so these are known results. And we can prove it with high probability that random projection is a, a suitable mapping that does this. So uh, I'll just skip past. Uh, uh, so the intuition is that the geometry of the data gets perturbed somewhat by the random projection, but not too much. Hopefully for application, not too much. Just skip past uh, that bunch. So, what is random projection? Okay, we generate a wide flat matrix with standard normal entries, say, orthonormalize the rows, and then uh, that gives us uh, a k dimensional projection of the original data. And one can show that with high probability, where the probability can be made as um, <coughs> the failure probability can be made as small as possible, as small as you choose. Um, that this uh, preserves the, uh, the geometric structure. Okay, this work is the work I've been, uh, so there have been various theoretical guarantees based on that, and they all make a priori assumptions on the, uh, some property of the data generator. Um, I think it's more interesting to look at, you know, if let's treat this as a compression problem, what's the, cost, what's the compressive cost in terms of uh, the mismatch between labels in the projected data? and labels for the original data. So uh, if we uh, use a particular choice of random projection matrix, we can get the exact probability of 
uh, such label flipping. And that will give us bounds on the, the performance of the data. And the uh, nicer the data is, or the easier the problem is, the tighter those bounds will be. So these automatically adapt to uh, nice properties in the data. If they want to make no assumptions about data generator at all, especially nothing beforehand, um, we're still going to assume we have IID sample, and then we uh, project the data, we see what the compression costs us. Okay. So this is uh, quantified in terms of the flipping probability, which is still independent of the uh, embedding dimension. Um, it doesn't grow with uh, the sample size. And what it depends on is uh, the angle between data points and the classifier in the original high dimensional space, and whether those end up being bigger than pi by two after or not. So, sorry, how am I doing for time? This, this, this is a bit confusing. It's a, it go, it, yes, it's been read all the time. It's, it started <laughs> off with, <laughs> it, start, it said one minute 50 at the start, and then it's sort of going up and down. It's a bit hard to so. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, I'm, okay. All right, fine, sorry. Uh, okay, so here, here's the sort of result we can prove. Uh, let me just uh, point out what the things are in there. So the thing on the left-hand side of the inequality is the probability that, uh, that the projected classifier disagrees with the uh, original classifier in the high dimensional space, and it's less than or equal to um, something that looks like a normal standard Vaknich-Chervenenkis pack style bound, but now in k-dimensional space rather than the original d-dimensional space, plus something that brings in the probability of this flipping. Okay, so those are the the terms in the bounds. Okay, so what makes the problem easy? Okay, so some of the things that have been used before, of course, so margins, separability of classes, sparsity, and so on, we can uh, capture all of these properties of data using something called the Gaussian width, which is essentially a, a, a single figure measure of how closely the original data resembles white noise. And uh, we can show that small Gaussian width is a sufficient condition for the classification problem to be easy. What do I mean by that? It needs small sample, whatever the original dimension. Okay. So some examples of small Gaussian width problems, easy problems. Large margin, uh, data lives in S-dimensional subspace, or it lives in the union of S-dimensional subspaces, or has some S-class representation. How am I doing? Thank you. Am I okay? <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry, okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.